In case you're just joining us, it's time for our conversation right now. I did say at the beginning of the program that we will be looking at uh, Body 2020 being threatened as a result of the fall in oil price. The fall we've been seeing recently due to the coronavirus outbreak and the spread of the virus across the world. My guests are joining me uh, right now in the studio is Obin Iraq, but he's an economic analyst. He's with me right here. Welcome to the program. Always a pleasure, Nancy. And Ade Dayo uh, Bakari is an investment research analyst at AfroInvest. He's joining me on Skype in Lagos. Hello, Ade Dayo. Welcome to the program. How are you? I'm very fine, Nancy. Thanks for having me today. Yes, thank you for joining us. Now, let me start with you. Um, you know, I don't want to say that I'm, sometimes you get tired of this. I did, I, can I see you? Are you there? Sometimes I don't want to say I get tired of saying this all the time because, I'm, you know, it's my duty every day. I try as much as possible to keep Nigerians up to speed with what's happening in the business space and in the markets. Every day, every passing day, I look at these numbers, not just oil, commodities and all of that. But with what we've seen, oil price has been falling in recent weeks. Uh, in fact, perhaps since even January. What, what is your take right now, Didayo? Okay. Um, I mean, the trend we've seen so far this year um, hasn't been a good one. Um, coming into the year, the forecast for, you know, um, major analysts and also um, international, you know, um, energy firms was that oil prices was going to be um, stable around $60 a barrel. The expectation was that, you know, as the um, global economy was recovering from um, the tensions, you know, um, towards the end of last year, the U.S. trade tensions had started to ease, and um, there were expectations that um, growth should, you know, recover a bit. And um, even the IMF projected um, an expansion in global growth um, in 2020. So um, um, in, on the supply side, um, the expectation was also that um, OPEC um, resumed, you know, some form of cuts in the last quarter of, of um, 2019. Um, so um, the balance of, you know, improved demand and tighter, you know, oil supply should lead to, you know, stable oil prices. But, um, you know, um, what we have seen this year so far is coronavirus has um, thrown another variable into the mix and demand is down globally and oil prices, you know, are trending downwards. Um, for Nigeria, the implication is going to be um, negative uh, because first, um, most of the government revenue still comes from oil. So if we have a budget uh, of, you know, $57 per barrel and oil is currently doing $50 per barrel, then that means the, go the funding gap of the Nigerian government will continue to expand. Now, um, on the basis of the budget, um, you know, coming into 2020, we're not quite optimistic that the government had enough you know, ability to even collect um, revenues to finance the budget, even with the passing of, um, you know, the new Finance Act, where you have um, VAT being increased um, from 5% to 7.5%. So we believe the government will still struggle to um, meet its obligations in um, 2020. The implication is they might resort to even more borrowing this year because mm -hmm. they have you know, um, more obligations. Um, the minimum wage has just been passed and um, implementation has already started. So um, it has to be funded one way or another. Okay. Then on the um, j j just hold on a bit, Adedayo. I'll... I'll uh, let me throw this question, the second question to you. When the budget 2020 was being crafted, I did, I, can I see you please? Um, when the budget 2020 was being crafted, that we saw, you know, the budget makers, budget office, Ministry of Finance crafting the budget. And some of us to say at that point that 57 US dollars a barrier was, you know, overly optimistic. Hasn't the chicken come home to roost right now? Or there's a possibility that it will still go back to 57 US dollars a barrel or even surpass 57 US dollars a barrel? Well, um, it's not exactly the case that um, the government was too optimistic. Like I mentioned, um, you know, what we've seen so far is um, a very high risk factor affecting global markets. And nobody anticipated it was going to happen this year. So, um, um, the, of course, it's always good when government is a bit, um, you know, more conservative in terms of its estimates. It's always a good thing because the implication is if um, oil prices is above um, the budget benchmark, 
um, that means we save more. So it's still a very good thing. So um, for the federal government, I think what to take note of is to be a bit, um, we should think about how to diversify really um, our revenues away from oil and also to reduce you know, the kind of um, benchmarks we set, um, the kind of expectations we have on the oil market should be moderate because it's a very volatile market and you never know what to expect. And with what we've seen this year with oil prices doing around $50 you know, a barrel, um, I think it, it paints a very good picture of what we might likely continue to see in the oil market. So I think the key takeaway is diversify away from oil revenues and continue to see how you can expand your non oil revenues about banking on you know, the overall economy. Okay. Let me come to uh, Mr. Rokwa here in the studio. What do you think you've had? Um, I did I uh, say his mind on some of these uh, key issues. What are your thoughts? Point blank. I think history has been very fair on us. And then uh, someone once said that history repeats itself. I don't want to use the last expression, uh, but the word fool was actually used by the um, philosopher that used it. We should have looked at trends. Yes, there's a shock with the coronavirus, but I think we are overtly optimistic with the 57. The much that could have happened is they could have kept it around 50, and then whatever was sold above 50 would have been surplus that would have applied to other sectors. And then I just talked about diversifying the economy. I, I, I wouldn't be in a hurry to get too optimistic along that tangent. Reason being that there are certain indices when you're talking about diversification. And then are we diversifying on the, on the eve of our 60th birthday? How long have we been on this story? I heard the last statement you made before we came to this segment. We'll keep talking. When are we going to keep acting? Uh, I think it was Abiola that said, if you spend 20 years learning how to be mad, how many years will you use to practice it? We have had the OLOP document designed by Dupe Adelaja and Creo at the uh, Smedan, Sm uh, Small Medium Enterprise Development Agency. It's been sitting there for a long time. What does OLOP document say? It says that every local government area has at least one product it has comparative advantage on. And then in any economy that is prone to depression, there are three things that will never go wrong. Food, people must eat. A country of over 200 million people. Do we also need to be told that we need to produce our foods? Now, we have closed the border. Now, what has happened? The, the, the prices of items has gone haywire. There are certain structural things that should have been done before we did certain things. But we went ahead and just went ahead and did it. Now, we have signed the African Continental Free Trade Area. What, and then we've introduced the visa policy. What are the implications? Did we prepare for the things that would happen? Nigeria even came to the party late. We came there after that five countries had signed. And even if you want to begin to query the document we went and signed into, what are the prospects that it will help us serve as a buffer with the coronavirus affecting the price of oil? Now, it will be interesting to drop here that most African countries require visa to get into, including Tanzania and a few other countries. So even the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement we've signed into may not deliver the, the dividends we had expected it would deliver even as much as we came into it very late. But that having been said, the long and short of it is that, let the truth be told, a few things need to be done right. There are areas Nigeria should begin to look at, just like Adedaya said, talking about diversification, manufacturing. But even that, I'm not going to get too ex optimistic. Because as I speak, the NAVDAQ DG herself gave a press statement a week and a few days ago and said that the only thing we produce in pharmaceuticals is water. Meaning that the components for manufacturing drugs in India come from China. So a lot of the prescription drugs that we will even need for our people to remain healthy, to do the work we need to do in manufacturing, comes from a, a part of the world that, of course, coronavirus is already beginning to affect. So the, it's, 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 it's very challenging. And then talking about even the, 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 the coronavirus, did we prepare for it? It's been ongoing. I heard the governor of Lagos State lamenting on, in the news this morning that uh, uh, people should have good conscience. And I began to laugh. Didn't we know that this thing has been on since last year? And then we didn't think about the, the implications in case it comes in here. It has finally come. Face mask has gone to 600 naira a piece. Uh, sanitizers, which Ebola gave us a signal to in 2014, we didn't know this was going to be necessary. And then preparing the centers, that, the centers of excellence. We have just about five according to the NCDC man. And so on. Did we prepare? If those five hadn't been built, which cost about 150 million to build one, uh, he was in the news about yesterday or two days ago, we would have needed to be flying the samples to South Africa. Yeah, but during the Ebola time, it was not. Because of the Ebola, they responded. 
and then we, we sat back. So it comes down to when I talked about history. We did not, we did not learn from the Ebola experience that we lost people. Now we have another crisis. Then Lassa fever has been here. We've been, I don't know to what extent we have managed as well as we should. And it's beginning to have implications for the economy. Okay. Adida, let me bring you in here. You know, the, 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 the big question or the big elephant in the room is that of oil price. If it continues to decline as we have seen it in the last few weeks, where do we go from here? Um, so much has been said about oil price, whether we are optimistic, cautious, or pessimistic about the prices. The issue is that should there be an institutionalized template that should be done so that any government that really comes into power, as we move along the diversification process, we toe that line of the template that has been done. You know what I'm saying, so? Because I remember during the Okonjoy Wala days, the Ngozi Okonjoy Wala days as Minister of Finance, something like that was being moved, you know, to have like, I don't want to say like an authority in terms of perhaps like a think tank that will come up with a template in terms of putting, okay, this should be what the benchmark should be at any particular time, putting all the scenarios together. With what's happening right now, do you think that there is a need to go back to that, or there is a need to do that? Um, absolutely. I feel um, there's always a need to do that, given um, the peculiar challenges of the Nigerian economy. We are almost, I mean, at every point in time, we are vulnerable to the external environment, either through, you know, um, you know um, global trades in goods and services, or even um, capital flows. So for me, I think, um, I mean, for us as a firm, too, we believe the government actually, and again, that is why everything is connected to um, the policies of the government. Um, having um, a coordinated and coherent plan towards um, winning Nigeria off oil and into some sectors, um, such as manufacturing, such as um, even modern services, ICT, entertainment, and the likes. Um, there are th good things, you know, to be pursued. Um, when you also think in terms of the large labor force we have in Nigeria, we need to start creating those opportunities to employ a lot of people. The entire oil sector we've been deliberating about, you know, since is not even up to 10% of the economy. And the capacity to employ a lot of people is not really in the oil sector because it's very, very capital intensive. So that means we really need to start looking for new growth areas within the economy, not just to drive growth closer to around 7% or double digit, but also to lift a lot of people out of poverty by employing them. So the major problem with having you know, um, a coordinated plan over um, several, I mean, a, a, a medium term plan or a long term plan in Nigeria is because of political risk. So you could have um, a government come in and start to, I mean, and start again from, you know, the foundation, start revising on um, policies that have been in place. And in a situation where we don't have, um, you know, good policy makers, they can, you know, start promoting policies that will not encourage um, long term growth and uh, um, investment in the country. Because in, in, for politicians, really, the consideration is usually the next election. So um, that uh, makes you not want to take steps that would actually lead to long-term growth and development because you want to prioritize um, you know, the next four years, um, make enough impact for people to see and vote you in or vote your party in. So the political, ri political risk is a very, very big um, um, aspect of implementing long-term development plans in Nigeria. And that's really what we should be looking towards, having strong leadership, and having um, sustainable policies. Mm. Mm. You know, it's, it's good that you brought in that bit of political risk. And that was why I asked that question, if there should be like an institutionalized framework for setting out the template of oil price, uh, even as we go beyond this administration and even any other administration or any other party at a c that comes uh, into power. When I was uh, reading what the IEA, the International a Energy Agency, did say about oil, he did say that all uh, demand will witness his first contraction in a decade, that first time in 10 years. OPEC will be meeting, I think, on the 5th, 5th is when either Friday or so. Uh, our own uh, person is there this, as the Secretary General, uh, Barry Kindo. Um, what do you think that OPEC, as well as its other allies, will be doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis this coronavirus outbreak as the meat, that's OPEC plus, as, as they normally uh, call it. And will, uh, will Russia come to the party 
right now in terms of cutting oil production, which invariably would affect Nigeria because uh, from the statistics, I think the last time we were able to produce 2 million barrels per day with its condensate, because we produce about 1.7 million with condensate, every other thing, making it 2 million or above. So what do you think? I mean, it's, um, OPEC is in a very tough place. And I think um, the decisions um, that we be taken in the meeting will depend, will depend largely on their outlook on um, how fast the world is going to respond to this outbreak, right? Um, earlier in the year, a lot of people were optimistic by the, that by the end of Q1, we should start to see um, the outbreak being contained and you could start to see, um, um, I mean, um, global economic activities uh, um, um, chugging along again. But really, with what we've seen over the past two weeks, um, shows that the pace of infections is not slowing down, and it is very, very likely that this might be extended um, for a while. So we believe on that part, um, OPEC um, also will be looking at all these considerations. Um, if they believe that um, you know, the impact of this virus and its impact on um, the second largest economy in the world, China specifically, um, is likely to be prolonged, then they might want to take um, actions you know, to maybe cut um, oil production to support prices. But right now, um, I'm not even so optimistic that that is going to be a silver bullet for the, for the block. Um, the U.S. keeps pumping a lot of oil. And also on the part of OPEC and the member countries, they've had to take a lot of cuts. You know, since 2017, um, they've been cutting um, um, OPEC countries, Russian countries, I mean, Russia and with, with Russia and other member uh, um, um, countries have been cutting production. So um, I don't believe um, what they need is more production cuts. Um, as long as demand is weak, if the global economy is not performing well, then even if they keep cutting um, production, um, it might not be too good for them. Because in the end, the, uh, um, I mean, due to globalization, the entire world is you know, very connected these days. Um, and um, in, the, in, the, in the financial markets as well, um, there are all kinds of sentiments you know, affecting the performance of uh, um, um, commodities. Commodities are traded globally. So um, you need to manage investor sentiments. You need to manage um, um, how you know, fiscal policy responds, how monetary policy responds also to the crisis. So um, for OPEC, I think they will take decisions to you know, support prices. But will it be enough? I'm not so quite optimistic it's going to be enough. OK, let me come to uh, Ovin. Yeah. Let's take a look at the budget a bit. In fact, what was also coming to my mind was that if all price continues to fall, that means it will halt definitely our revenues. Yeah. If it continues the way it is going now, the speed at which it's rising, falling, we saw at the weekend 49 US dollars a barrel. During my analysis at 51 today, we don't know what will happen tomorrow. That means that the pockets or Nigeria's pockets will be hit. Some risk will be involved, even paying salaries, government workers now, the minimum wage and all of that. What, what risk should we be looking at now? And are there ways to avoid it? Quick ways to avoid that because I, one may say, okay, diversification. We know diversification is not a story of now, now, now. In fact, was it the VP that said you need all money to even diversify? The all yeah. money right now is not looking pretty. So what are the risks and are there things that we can do in the immediate term that can, you know, mitigate that? Okay, point blank. In, in um, financial management, once you find yourself in the ditch, stop digging. Long and short is that if you look at the budget, 10.3 uh, um, trillion. Now, the, all the states put together 9.6 trillion. So the total budget of the federal and the states is about 20 trillion. Now, uh, according, uh, this is the decade of action for the SDGs, 17 goals. Now, you need $85 billion for you to drive the decade of action, which is 10 years. But I'll give you a statistics that will blow your mind right now. At the rate of 360 naira to a dollar, our whole budget, state and federal, is $56 billion. You need $85 billion per, per, per annum as a country for you to drive the decade of action every year. Nigeria doesn't have it. So we have made our mistakes by not diversifying when the oil was, was in booming. Forget the 70s or 60s. Even in the two, 2000, 2000 and, between 2011 and 2015, we know how much we made a surplus from oil. Where did we put all of that money? And now that we are facing challenges, like you said, what is the immediate thing we need to do? Mm. The recurrent exp expenditure needs to come down. We need to tighten our belt. Now, it will shock you to hear that about 0.2% of our population, about 400,000 persons are employed in the whole of the civil service, consume about 3% of our income. 
You just talked about minimum wage. It's not going to get any better. So if we need to go into some level of handshake with the political, pers uh, political uh, officials, personnel, and the civil servants, we need to begin to talk to ourselves. We need to look inwards. This virus is not about a bit. The countries that it has hit, of course, you've seen what has happened in Italy. It has, it has, it has doubled. The other a few countries, that, so we don't know what is hitting us until somebody comes out to tell us exactly where this is coming from and what we need to do about it. Long and short, this is affecting travel. It's affected, of course, tourism. Logistics, it's affecting logistics. Sure. The airlines are Trade, complaining. Yeah. Sports is complaining. Almost every, every segment is affected by this virus. So let's call it spirit, spirit. Let's come back inward. But it's not all doom. Long and short is that we have everything we need. Okay. 200 million people. Okay. What we need to do now in the immediate is that the, the, we have implemented some interventionist programs by the central bank. We have the anchor borrower scheme. We have the creative industry uh, uh, fund. Uh, fund. And a few other things we have done. Can we do some monitor and evaluation to know to what extent that has happened? Even the CBN governor last week came out and said, at the rate we are depleting our reserves, it may not last four years. So we need to look inwards and say, what are we doing? What, where are the areas of dissipation? Where are we losing money? And begin to look at what we can do inwards to begin to help ourselves. Look at fintech. What are young people able to do with fintech? What are we doing with the ICT? What are we doing with manufacturing? That, again, is also a challenge because we still need some of these implements to be able to drive it, like you said, oil money, uh, helping us to div diversify. We need to sit down, like you rightly said, set up a think tank at the different levels, st federal, state, and local government levels. Now that we've given autonomy to the local government areas, they are the president, the local government chairman are the presidents that the local government people are going to see. I strongly believe that what has even kept us going is not this budget we're talking about about is the private persons who have by dint of hard work despite the challenges in the economy where we are producing 5,000 megawatts when ideally we need 40,000 this year and we need 3.5 billion dollars investment in, 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 in power for us to be able to even get this economy running so people are finding things in 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 mm -hmm. in, in, in Katsina just about two days ago the turbines the turbines were powered and they're going to just give us about 10 10 megawatts Okay, let me, let me come to Adedayo. That brings me to the question of fiscal, fiscal policy. Mm. You know why I just g did like that? Fiscal policy, after the budget, what else do we hear? Nothing, apart from the finance act that we saw from the uh, uh, fiscal side. Um, the next MPC will be holding in a, just a few weeks from now. <laughs> Is uh, all eyes, will it be on uh, Mephila and his team, even as all price dwindles? I mean, absolutely, um, um, monetary policy-wise, um, the next action of um, the CBN will be one to watch. They're in a difficult place. Um, you know, reserves are not quite strong. Reserves have been, you know, declining um, um, almost every week. Um, oil prices, you know, low, um, not so strong to support the budget, I mean, to support um, reserves. Um, when you think in terms of capital flows to um, foreign portfolio investment, foreign direct investment, Although we don't have current data on that, um, we have only Q3 data on that, but it's not been strong as well, and um, it's been on a downtrend. So really, the question is, can um, the CBN continue with its current policies, um, especially related to the exchange rate? Um, we continue to, you know, intervene to, um, you know, we don't want to adjust the exchange rate, but every, fact, every single factor is cost calling for an adjustment. Um, we believe that um, it's easier to make all these um, you know, um, slight adjustments than making um, very sharp adjustments. So um, the CBN will, um, you know, um, be helping the economy if it makes um, a slight adjustment in exchange rates. Um, it's better to make, you know, 5% changes than having um, a 40%, you know, change in exchange rate like we had um, between 2016 and 2017, for instance. That is usually bad for the economy and for the financial services sector because a lot of the banks are still reeling you know, from the impact of the exchange rate devaluation, which affected the ability of some companies to service their loans. Um, on fiscal policy, um, I think, um, yes, the obsession is usually around budgets, but um, government has also been doing um, other things. Um, trade, for instance, um, is also part of fiscal policy. Um, we know the border has been closed um, since August 2019. Now, the impact, the immediate impact was a rise in inflation, right? Um, um, you know, inflation continues to rise, and we expect that it to continue to trend higher, especially due to um, you know, the new VAT increase. And if also electricity prices are adjusted, then you're expecting um, above 13% inflation um, in 2020. Now, um, on border, um, you know, 
trade is not exactly a bad thing. Um, we tend to look at trade as um, a bad thing in Nigeria, especially imports. But it's actually very relevant because for you to have an industrial economy, for you to yeah. have a big manufacturing sector, you need raw materials. So um, you also need, you can't produce all items and you need to make, um, and the way to make some items cheap for your um, households is to import them. Now, Dangote um, Cement released a report of the uh, annual performance um, last week. And what yeah. we saw was that exports declined by 41% mm. due to you know, the land border closure. So beyond, you know, um, we talk about oil prices a lot, but we need to start thinking of the real sector and how you know, the policies of the government is even affecting the capacity of people or Locals. I mean companies yeah. to do their business. Mm. Because if businesses are not making money, then you're not earning the so-called non-oil revenues yeah. that we, we see government should start earning. Mm. So for us, we think the focus should be on, um, you know, there are a lot of risk factors around. Um, government should look at areas that are easy to, you know, just make slight decisions that could lead to big gains. One of that for us is we consider the land border closure, continue to support the agri sector, but go beyond cheap credit. You know, it's, it's one thing to give cheap credit to farmers. Uh, um, you know, farming is an entirely different thing. Cheap credit will not, put, will not you know, protect a farm against insecurity, definitely. Mm. Um, cheap, um, cheap credit will not um, you know, educate farmers on the right um, land to use, the right products to plant on particular lands, you know, the kind of fertilizer to use. And I mean, to boost the yields, Nigeria has one of the poorest um, some of the poorest yields of all, almost all products, from rice to oil palm to tomato, okay. yields are very, very poor. So okay. um, those are things for mm. government to look at. Okay, let me bring in uh, Obina. What do you think? Uh, he said a few things, and uh, you just answer in a few um, seconds because we're coming to the end of the show. I want to ask a question on diversification so that we'll close the show on that. Yeah, we'll still go back to low-hanging fruits. You mm. talked about agriculture. The question we need to ask is, what's the ratio, the agric extension ratio? It's about one to about 30,000 agric extension officers. He just talked about knowing the right seeds to plant, the right soil type, and then even the, the, the measurement. For you to grow maize, you need about 12 meters gap. But what do we do? We have about three meters. So just obeying that, that law of 12 meters doubles your production. Do our farmers know that? Who is doing agric extension for them? Then talking about insecurity, how far are we going to go? Where are the agro rangers? And do we really need agro rangers to guard us in the farms? How many are they? Are they? How many staff do you have in the state? Well, just like call? you said, credit will not guarantee security. No, you cannot. In fact, if there's insecurity, the monies that were being given to the farmers as loans all will be gone and wiped. Check Aduna, check, check KB, check all of the places you gave the Anko Borua scheme. How much have you re recovered from the farmers? Okay. And then, of course, the politicization of the process. So it's a lot, but it's not all doom. Long and short, how did Asia grow? The Asian tigers, do we believe in our people, give them the enabling environment? With the new finance bill, to what extent would that also hamstring some of our people? Have we engaged our people? Is there a bottom-up approach? Or do we just drop things on our people, and then you, you're coming with a, a tariff hike, and then you're, you're giving us with one hand and taking with the other hand? It's not all casting aspersions. I believe that a few things are right, and I think the mindset is right, but I think we need to be brought into a room and have a talk. Okay. Um, Adedayo, let me end with you and on the diversification note. In fact, when I was looking at some diversification models for some countries, uh, Mr. Rokba has spoken about Asia. The one that comes mm. to my mind that is very close to us is that of Dubai. You know, the diversification model of Dubai. I remember that this, the largest international carrier, I don't want to advertise for them, but both of you know the airline I'm talking about from that uh, wing of the world started about close to 30 years ago. Dubai was like, you know, was a, was a desert. Yeah. But it took the vision of a man, uh, Sheikh Al-Rashid Al-Hatoum, I think so, in yeah. 1958 to 1990. And his son took over from that. In fact, I tell our policy makers, go and read the book, My vision, vision, so that you understand how vision works for a country. So if you take a look at this, Dubai is also in a peculiar situation like we are, they are all producers too. But as at now, Dubai oil contributes just less than 1% to their GDP of Dubai. They've been able to diversify their economy. And oil was just uh, you know, discovered in 1969 in Dubai. Are there lessons that we can take from this uh, uh, emirate that is just close to us from Nigeria six to hours. Dubai is about, is it six or eight six, hours? Six. And a lot of us travel to Dubai to go and see 
uh, the tallest building and all of that. Why can't we replicate that here? Okay, um, um, I think the first thing I would note is, yes, there are a lot of lessons to take away from um, the stories of um, Asian economies as well as Dubai. Um, but with Dubai, one thing to note is also that um, they've been able to raise capital, even domestically, to finance uh, most of these uh, um, things around tourism that uh, keeps attracting people to the, um, 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 I mean, obviously to your country. And one of the reasons they've been able to do that is um, that in terms of population, they are not a lot. If you look at oil production per barrel, um, I mean per head, co um, comparing mm. Middle Eastern countries like Dubai to Nigeria, you see that Nigeria is very, very low. In fact, many people will tell you we are not an oil producing country. When you think in terms of the 200 million people that are sharing just less than 2 million barrels per day, um, um, you know, every year. So what it means for us is in terms of vision, we can look at Dubai for vision, right? Um, beyond manufacturing, we can look at services sectors. Um, um, I mean, my colleague just mentioned fintech. Um, you have um, entertainment, the entertainment sector, which has um, um, been doing well of late. You, um, you're seeing new capital in that area as well. You're thinking in terms of ICT. In fact, over the past two years, ICT has been driving the economy. So it's something to you know, take advantage of. Also locally, we need to start thinking of how to raise capital to even fund most of the things we want to fund. Mm -hmm. And in a case where we do not have capital, how do we attract capital. foreign investment? <laughs> Exactly. So that is really what we need to be thinking about. Nigeria's savings rate is currently low, yeah. so we need external capital. Okay. We need to attract capital. Okay. And how do we attract capital? Capital is by putting in place all these long-term, you know, initiatives to attract capital. Okay. Um, I think I, I think I, to... I think that I did. I will stop here. That my director is just in my ears. Time up. That I've got to go. That I've got to go. I think we'll leave it at that. But with what we've just said now. Uh, other topics are sprouting up in terms of how do we attract capital into the country and perhaps what vision should we be having right now that will move Nigeria into the next decade because we are in the, in the new decade. What Nigeria do we want to have in the new decade and some other things around what we've said. Thank you very much, Adedaya, for joining me today. Uh, say me hi to your colleagues over there at AfroInvest. All right, I've been speaking with Adeda Yobaker, an investment research analyst at AfriInvest. Thank you also to Obina Rakba, uh, an economic analyst. We've been looking uh, at um, the implication of the recent fall, not the recent fall because it's been happening in the past few weeks, uh, talking about oil price and our budget, the risk uh, that are facing us right now. What should we do? We'll continue the show tomorrow, God willing. Be the best you can be. Be the change you want to see. I am.